Thank you very much, Raphael. That was really amazing. Next up on the stage will be Jeff. And so please give a warm round of applause to Jeff as he comes up. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everybody. Oh, cool. Uh, my name is Jeff, um, also known as Program on the Internet. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about a little research project that I started recently called WANIX. It's an experimental, local-first, web-native development environment. So let's unpack that. Uh, local-first, how many of you are familiar with this local-first concept? Ooh, a couple of you. That's cool. OK, so uh, this is spearheaded by an industrial research uh, company called Ink and Switch. Um, the general idea is it's sort of a response to the cloud data ownership model that uh, got, got us into this mess. And the general idea is to keep your data local, but also allow online collaboration, uh, sort of the best of both worlds of cloud and traditional software. Uh, Local-first software is more responsive. It continues to work offline. It syncs when you're online with uh, other devices, as well as your collaborators. Um, and it's mostly built on a technology called conflict-free uh, replicated data types, which is a mouthful, CRDTs. And the general idea is it's a data structure in which the operations um, on it can be uh, replicated to other people, and they can be replicated out of order and across time. And you get eventual consistency uh, without like, a central server. So this is really cool. We'll come back to that. And web native, this is a little bit more straightforward. Uh, this is a big deal because the web is the only ubiquitous open platform. Uh, the technology, though, is not specific to the cloud. Uh, we have local web view apps like VS Code and Slack, right? Um, there's efforts like progressive web apps and Project Fugu that are pushing the capabilities of what you can do in a web view or in a browser. But can it be a development environment? And some of you might have said, well, I've seen Glitch, I've seen Replit, and Code Spaces, right? So yeah, right? Actually, these are just front ends to development environments. Um, all the actual uh, tool chains are run on servers in the cloud. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions, one called uh, StackBlitz, which is a VC-funded company that uh, it's actually only JavaScript. What, th what they've done is they have a, uh, a semi-proprietary way of running Node.js in the browser, sort of. And the way they do this is actually using a technology called WebAssembly, which is uh, pretty cool, but sounds really boring. It's a portable bytecode <laughs> format. Um, but it works in all browsers. It's also being used in the cloud. And more and more languages can be compiled to it and therefore run in the browser. Uh, it's also the future of software components, um, but that's a whole big thing that we can't get into. WebAssembly, though, brings us to WANIX, finally, which uh, the story of is actually just starts a few weeks ago as that strange loop. Um, and, uh, it started with uh, Go Playground. So Go is a programming language, a simple compiled systems language. It's sort of uh, people associate it with Google, but it actually has stronger roots in Bell Labs and Plan 9, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, Go can be uh, compiled to WebAssembly, like a lot of other languages. But the Go compiler is written in Go. And it's sort of self-bootstrapped in that way. Uh, so, the com so the compiler can be compiled to WebAssembly and run in the browser. That's pretty interesting. Um, but I hadn't really seen that. The official Go Playground, which this is not, but the official Go Playground, uh, the way it works is when you can write some code and then you hit run, it sends that code to a server, server compiles it up there, it then runs the result up there and then takes the results and sends it back. It's like you could just run that all in the browser if you could do this WebAssembly stuff. So I tried it, uh, and sure enough, uh, we could do it. So in this example, um, when you hit run, it compiles it in the browser, and we get the result, and it ran that. And it was actually pretty fast. I don't know if you can see that, but that's the output. And this is all made possible uh, in part by developing a virtual file system, uh, uh, in-memory file system inside the browser, um, because the compiler needs to read source file off a file system and then write the binary to it. 
And I was thinking, and I don't know if it's because Go has a link to like Bell Labs and Unix, or if I just think about Bell Labs and Unix a lot, but I was like, this, you know, we're not, with a file system and a compiler, you're not far off from what was used to bootstrap Unix. So we can have a uh, Unix-like environment here. So what else do we need? We need like a, a shell, uh, you know, eh, maybe an editor. That's pretty much it, right? Unix is sort of the OG uh, software development environment. So I made this. It's called Wanix. Um, we've got a little shell in the browser. We can look at this file system. We've got some built-in commands uh, like cat. We can see what you know that main.go file from before. Um, but then we can also run WebAssembly. So we can say build. This runs the Go compiler, and then it produces a binary now on that file system. And we can see there there's main, and so we can actually run that, and it runs it just like the playground before, right? Uh, so this is interesting. This is a Unix-like environment running entirely in the browser. Uh, it's written in Go. Uh, which is not a normal language that you'd have running in the browser. Uh, and what else? Uh, so it's about 2,000 lines of Go. And this is not like Bash or anything. This is a custom thing. Uh, it's not quite POSIX compliant yet. But uh, this is actually a terminal emulator in the browser. It's actually based, uh, it's using Xterm.js, which is a same terminal emulator used for VS Code and a bunch of other stuff. Which means that we can actually, uh, these binaries can write to the terminal like you actually could with normal terminal software. Um, so, for example, like editors and stuff, uh, Vim and whatnot. There's actually an editor uh, written in Go called Micro. So we compiled that to WebAssembly. Now we can run that. And now we have this editor in this environment. And it's, you know, it's got syntax highlighting, it's got uh, mouse support. Um, well, this is pretty cool. So we actually have like everything now to like write code. We can compile code, and we have a shell and a file system to kind of glue it all together. Um, so that's pretty cool. This is all happening in the browser, but you know we're not really taking too much advantage of the fact that we're in the browser. Um, you know what about web development? Most of the, if you are developers, you're probably web developers. So why do you? What about web development? Well, Wanix has a concept of apps. Um, you see there's a couple here. If we open uh, the Play app, you can see that that's actually the playground I showed you before. But this is actually inside the Wanix environment. I can pull down this console um, and work with the Wanix environment. If we look inside the directory for this Play app, it's just a normal web page, website. It's got an index.html, trusty jQuery. If, if we look in the index.html, you can see it's just loading resources. What's weird is like, this, all of this is happening in uh, an index.html that has nothing but loading a WASM file. So where is it getting these files? It looks like it's just loading from you know, the same directory on the server. It's actually, uh, there's a service worker that's intercepting requests and then pulling them from this in-memory Wanix uh, file system. Okay, but what about real web applications, right? Where, you know, where's React? Where's all the stuff you can do with, you know, bas basically I'm saying like, can you, know, uh, can you run Node.js in this, right? If you're a JavaScript developer, you kind of are pretty dependent on Node.js. Um, but the answer is no, you can't, <laughs> and this is kind of intentional. I've been spending the last few years trying to figure out a way to do web development software, uh, front-end JavaScript development in a way that's actually enjoyable. Um, so. I basically, as a constraint, said, let's see if I can do this without Node.js. And I got pretty far. I've been doing web development without Node.js for a while. Um, and I integrated that sort of stack into the system. So um, to, give you, to kind of show you uh, what we can do with this, what we can do without Node.js, um, I'll show you a little app here. It's just a to-do app, your typical you know, demo to-do app. Uh, you know, we can. Uh, check items off, we can delete items, you know, obviously you can create items. So pretty simple. Let's look at the source for this, right? So we can just like open this up and look, what? There's only just a couple of files. There's an index, you know, I don't know if you can see that, index.html, model.ts, view.jsx. Where's the package.json? Where's the, you know, dozens of configuration files. Where's, where's the gigabyte of node modules? Uh, 
what there is, you know, this is a TypeScript file. There's also a JSX file. Like, normally you need Node.js for that stuff, right? You need the TypeScript compiler. All right, what's going on here? Well, if we uh, look a little closer, let's open up the uh, view.jsx. And sure enough, we've got JSX, right? It's kind of like embedded HTML and JavaScript. It's sort of popularized by React. Um, in this case, we're using Mithril, which is a great little tiny version of React that has no dependencies. Um, all right, well, let's look at this other source file, the model.ts. Um, and this is, sure enough, it's TypeScript. Uh, we've defined an interface. Um, we have a class with some methods with typed arguments. So yeah, it's a little API around local storage. Pretty simple. So, but maybe we're just running all this through Babel, right, uh, at runtime. So let's open up the index. No, there's no Babel. You know, we pull in Mithril, but then we, imp we do ES imports directly against those TypeScript and JSX files. Well, how does that work? Um, so uh, a little side story. It took 10 years for the JavaScript community to realize that if they did all their um, text processing heavy you know, pre-processing and transpiling in a language other than JavaScript, like a systems language like C or Rust or Go, it'd be an order of magnitude faster. And I don't know if any of you have used Vite. You know, it's kind of the cool hotness for dev stuff. Uh, uh, it's actually based on a project called ESBuild. And ESBuild is a um, transpiler for TypeScript and JSX and a bunch of other stuff. It's a bundler, but it's written in Go. So it's incredibly fast. Um, I should have brought the little graph, but it's like, you know, ES build is like this, and everything else is just like takes forever. Um, so what we ended up doing was putting uh, ES build because it's Go. We embedded it in this environment, and because it's so fast, we just do it on the fly. So our service worker that's serving all of these requests just translates uh, uh, using ES build on the fly when it pulls from the file system. Okay, well that's pretty cool. And you know this is a development environment, so we gotta have you know like hot reloading, so we can make a change and hit save, and it changes in the background. Um, if you didn't see that, we can we'll make another change. Let's go change the uh, uh, the header and the, the that to dos header. We'll just change it to like my to dos or something like that, uh, and we'll hit save. And if I make this console go away, we can see the change. Uh, okay, so this is pretty cool. We've got like you know, TypeScript, JSX, you know, ES imports, live reloading, all this without Node.js. So it's kind of a, you know, JavaScript development simplified. So let's say you're like, OK, make, making a little web app in here. How do you get out of this crazy WANX environment, right? Uh, we made a little tool for that. Uh, it's called Export App. And this is a shell script in this shell environment, uh, which turns out we can't run here. Um, this whole thing's on Rails, and that's just a mistake that's built in here. But export app, when it works, um, it compiles a Go binary that embeds all the assets into that binary. Uh, and then it, because the Go compiler can cross-compile to any platform, it da uh, the download that we got is a native uh, uh, Mac binary. So this just pulled from this web page, right? There's nothing, no servers here. So if we dequarantine it and chmod it, we can run this little binary and let's see what happens. We get a little web server. <laughs> if we go to that URL, we get our app, just as it was in the WANX environment. And we could actually take this, have it compile to a Linux binary, throw that in a Docker container, and put it online, we're done. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but maybe you're unconvinced. I know some of you are. So what else can we do? Well, I was talking about that local first stuff, right? Uh, this is definitely very local. Uh, but where's the collaboration? Where's the CRDTs? Um, well, let's put some CRDTs in here. There's a bunch of these sync databases, sync stores um, popping up for CRDTs. This one's called Jazz. And so uh, if you go to jazz.tools, you can try this out. Um, I have early, had early access to this, so uh, you know, I made a to-do app in the WANX environment using it. It's pretty much the same thing, except we have a couple of new UI elements. We have the, some identity. Um, it says program A, if you can see that. Um, so I logged in with pass keys, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then we have this invite button, which puts a URL into your clipboard. Um, so 
you know, presumably we'd give this to another user, to person on the internet, they could put it in their browser. So we'll simulate that here. Um, and uh, unfortunately, right now, you know, it doesn't take you directly into the app. It puts you in this uh, WANX environment. We have to manually log in here. But this will let me show you pass keys, which are pretty cool. Um, so this is pass keys. It's in all browsers. Um, passwordless login. The future is now. Um, so now we're sort of authenticated. And uh, I'm going to run this other command called jazz mount. We'll come back to that. But now we can finally open this jazz to do's thing. Um, all right, and the data has been replicated, right? Um, and anything we do in one shows up in the other. You've seen this before, right? Real time collaboration. What I can't really demo here is uh, if either one of these went offline, we could keep making changes. And then when we come back online, the changes would just merge and synchronize. Um, so that's sort of the magic of CRDTs. But uh, I'll show you something else that's maybe even a little cooler. So what if we took CRDTs and applied it to the WANX environment, basically made our file system powered by CRDTs? That's actually what JazzMount did. It sort of mounted a CRDT-based file system uh, in this WANX environment. So we should be able to like, make a file in this environment, uh, in this session. Well, you know, hello from program B. And we save that. And we should be able to go over to this environment and because it's been replicated over there, if I do a normal ls, um, it should be listed there. So ls, file b, and we can cat it. We'll see, oh, hello from program b. And since we have this sort of live real-time connection, we can also just send a message. So at program b, I don't know, we'll say, like, thanks. I don't know why. But we'll go over here, and it shows up as a pop-up. It's just this is a weird research project. Anyway, um, so. Uh, so that typo, I don't know if that's bothering anybody. It's bothering me. But we have the source, so we should be able to just change this, right? Um, we, and maybe if we change it here, it'll show up over there, right? Um, we've got live reloading. So let's uh, open that file, uh, jazz to do view.jsx. And we'll find that pesky typo. And so we'll ch make a change. And then when we hit save, it should you know, live reload here and then eventually over there. So let's see. We'll hit save. Save. All right. You can't see it, but uh. actually, there was a little delay. That's because Jazz has a bug. Sorry. It's a little slow, but it's very real time. Uh, we can make another change. It shows up. So when they fix that, it'll be as real time as the, uh, as the other uh, data stuff. So what's cool about this is we have collaboratively self-modifiable applications. And that's kind of the point of what I'm trying to do with this project, is exploring uh, the implications of that. So malleable applications that the users can change while they're using them, uh, using kind of you know, traditional, you know, conventional JavaScript uh, technologies and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, this is the uh, uh, project that I'm going to be open sourcing in a couple of weeks. Again, this was all just in the last few weeks that we made this. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you could join this Discord. And we uh, can give you access to the repository. And play around and research with me if you want. Uh, so that's WANX. Thanks, everybody. Awesome, awesome. Well, that was very fun and exciting. Please, please, please check out the URL, join the Discord. And again, feel free to talk to Jeff afterwards.